One southern city, nestled comfortably along the Cape Fear River of North Carolina, seems to have escaped the worst excesses of the Jim Crow years. Wilmington seemed to be a racially moderate city, a condition brought about by economic prosperity and a strong black and white middle class. The best feeling among the races prevailed in Wilmington. The Negro and his white brother walked their beats on the police force. White and black committeemen sat down together in the same council. White and black teachers taught in the same school. David Fulton. It was a booming place for African Americans. They simply felt as if they were making a contribution to society 33 years after they were freed through Emancipation Proclamation. It was a prospering African American community in the largest city of the state. They had attained some success in the middle classes. There was a growing mercantile class. What happened was a number of blacks were able to transfer skills that they learned in slavery to private enterprise. On the plantation, they were blacksmiths, they were carpenters, they were teamsters. They had all these different skills that they learned in slavery, which uh, they weren't being compensated for. But now they were able to take those skills and transfer them into business, and that's what happened. That first generation out of slavery sort of bought the dream. They thought that they would get education, they would rise, they would be successful, and that that kind of performance would prove their manhood and womanhood. One successful Wilmington African American was Alex Manley, publisher of the Wilmington Daily Record, the only black daily newspaper in North Carolina. He says his relationship with whites is good, and there's every reason to believe that. White merchants advertise extensively in the Daily Record, but he clearly sees the future place of black people as being full equality. There's no question about that. And he's constantly encouraging them to become equals economically, politically, socially, culturally. There were many whites who were poverty stricken, but there were many blacks who had very good paying jobs. Of course, they had their carriages and their nice dress, and they would shop and they felt as if they had come a long way. And they were beginning to feel themselves in a prideful sort of way, and I, I think to a degree in an arrogant sort of way. So there we had much tension created. How dare you think that you are so much better than I am? It's partly economic competition, but it's also a, a, a grave concern that Black people are beginning to feel the equals to white people. White people became quite alarmed because if they were going to subjugate black people, they had to prove that no black person was capable of the things that these people were doing. Blacks had attained a good deal of power in Wilmington in 1898. They were the majority of the population and of the voting population. Many of the blacks at that time held elected positions and very prominent municipal positions. They were appointed by the Republicans. Most of the Republicans at that time were black. Justices of the peace, aldermen, magistrates, firemen, public health workers, even though these might not appear to be very high prestige positions, at least they were examples to the black community and particularly to the youth of what black people could be. Whites were fearful that the African Americans would begin to control the city of Wilmington since they were in the majority. We had to look at two very basic issues. You have to look at politics and you have to look at economics. And whoever controls those two are in power. And it was all about power, about political power and economic power. In the statewide and local elections of 1898, the Democratic Party the party of white supremacy was determined to end black political power in North Carolina. It will be the meanest, vilest, dirtiest campaign since 1876. The slogan of the Democratic Party, from the mountains to the sea, will be but one word, nigger. Daniel Shank, Democrat. They argue that only the Democrats can save 
North Carolina from what they call Negro rule. Fernifold Simmons, who would go on to be a United States Senator, Charles Aycock, who would go on to be governor of North Carolina, and Josephus Daniels, who was editor of the Raleigh News and Observer. The three of them got together in a hotel and hatched a campaign that would talk about white women being endangered by black men holding office. The white press portrayed blacks as monsters, representing them as an incubus, a mythical figure that raped women while they slept. White women appeared in parades, on floats, in white dresses, holding up signs saying, protect us. Manley's blood boils, and he dashes off his own editorial that conservative black people in Wilmington considered to be a truth unwisely said. The crowning thing that hit the white psychic nerve center was the very last sentence of the editorial where he says, if white men continue to initiate sex with black women, sooner or later white women are going to start to do the very same thing with black men. And that was not the political thing to say. Uh, that just drove white men absolutely crazy. A former Confederate officer, Alfred Waddell, called for violence. We are resolved to change the conditions under which we live if we have to choke the Cape Fear River with caucuses. White employers are threatening to fire black employees who register to vote. So there's massive economic intimidation going on. An organization of black women urged black men to vote or risk disgrace. Every Negro who refuses to register this next Tuesday in order that he may vote, we shall make it our business to deal with him in a way that shall not be pleasant. He shall be branded as a white-livered coward who would sell his liberty. Blacks meant to win by legal means, whites by any means. We shall win tomorrow if we have to do it with guns. If we have not the votes to carry the election, we must carry it by force. If you find a Negro voting, tell him to leave the poll. If he refuses, kill him. Alfred Waddell. Despite all the intimidation, many, many black voters were turning out and were voting. So the word goes out from Democratic headquarters that if we can intimidate the black votes and get a majority that way, we will simply stuff the ballot boxes. And that's exactly what they do. Every black candidate in North Carolina was defeated. But in Wilmington, the political victory did not satisfy white anger. A mob set Manley's newspaper on fire, and every black official was driven out of office. They could not wait until it was time for the change of office to take place. They decided to take control of everything. It was basically a coup. They just took the offices away from the duly elected office holders. So there are no longer any black officials in Wilmington city government. The coup was followed by a massacre. Firing began, and it seemed like a mighty battle in wartime. They went on firing, it seemed, at every living Negro, poured volleys into fleeing men like sportsmen firing at rabbits in an open field. The shrieks and screams of children, of mothers and wives, caused the blood of the most inhuman person to creep. Men lay on the street dead and dying, while members of their race walked by, unable to do them any good. Reverend Alan Kirk. They went after uh, business owners. They went after voters. They went after doctors and black lawyers. Those are the people they ran out of town because those are the people they saw as getting out of their place and therefore encouraging other black people to get out of their places. Despite the odds against them, some blacks fought back. Others protested to the federal government. Blacks from all over the United States wrote letters to the President of the United States begging him to intervene and to stop the violence and the killing of women. President William McKinley remained silent. I think it showed that the national government had lost its commitment to protecting the 
civil and political rights of blacks, especially in the South. The destruction of black political power in North Carolina unleashed a wave of racial discrimination triumphantly announced in newspapers and printed on postcards. Facilities that were once integrated were now legally segregated. Public transportation and parks, restaurants and theaters, jobs and juries. The relative oasis that North Carolina had been for blacks was now a desert of white supremacy. <laughs>